I'd like you all to think for a moment about what you had for dinner last night. And contemplate this, uh, we all know that we are what we eat, but that's not always a good thing. So think as closely as you can about what you had for dinner. If you're like most Americans, you had one of the three primary food groups. You had a hamburger, you had a piece of pizza, or you had a chicken nugget. Or maybe you're health conscious and you had a big salad with some lettuce and tomatoes and maybe some sunflower seeds, because you're health conscious. What I would like you to think about is, uh, if you can for a moment, think about where that food came from. Where did the hamburger meat come from? Specifically, where did it come from? What state did it come from? If you had a piece of pizza, where did that flour come from? Where did the tomato sauce come from? If you had a chicken nugget, what is a chicken nugget, actually? <laughs> and if you're health conscious, uh, where did that lettuce come from? And how many calories did you get from that lettuce? A couple calories, right? 10, 15 calories. And it probably was grown in California. How many calories of fossil fuels did it take to get that lettuce to you so you could have very few calories in your meal? Or if you had a tomato, what country, what continent did that tomato come from if you ate it in March in Delaware where no tomatoes grow? This is what I want you to think about. And then I'd like you to contemplate for a moment how many generations of human beings in the history of human beings have not been able to tell you where their food came from specifically? Like what farm grown by what farmer in what season? And the answer to that question is about three generations of people. About three generations of human beings have not been able to tell you where their food came from. And that has led to all kinds of strange consequences that we are only beginning to understand. So what I would like to suggest is that a lot of this predicament that we find ourselves in, and I'm telling you it's a very serious predicament with all kinds of very dire health consequences and environmental consequences, has its roots in the post-World War II era. So think about this for a second. Before the 1940s, most Americans lived either in cities or they lived on farms. There was no suburbia to speak of. After the war, we came back after this trauma in Europe, and we learned a few things from the Germans, including how you can build an infrastructure to defend yourself. So we built the interstate highway system. Now, you may not think of this, but the internet, if you drive up and down I-95 on the East Coast, every now and then you'll see a road sign that says the Eisenhower Interstate Highway System with five stars in a circle. Those are the five stars for Dwight Eisenhower's rank as the commanding officer of the Allied Forces. The interstate highway system was built in what we would now think of as a, uh, a measure of homeland security to protect our country from invasion, to move troops and vehicles around the country safely. It's 47,000 miles long. It connects all the major cities in the United States, north, south, east, west. What it allowed people to do for the first time in American history was to work in the city and build a house in what they used to call the country. So millions and millions of people came back from the war, and they started to use these big highways to build houses outside the city and commute back into the city. That's a story we all are familiar with. That's how suburbia was born. What's less understood is that we turned four million small farms into tens of millions of houses. So the joke nowadays, or it has been for 30 or 40 years, is that farms on the East Coast don't grow food, they grow houses. So most of my students at the University of Delaware grew up in places like this, in a subdivision that was built sometime in the last 20, 30, or 40 years. Our land was totally transformed in this period from farms and forests into housing and shopping malls. This is something we all are familiar with. We've all grown up with it as if it is a given, as if this is the way the land has always been. It has not always been this way. A consequence of this is that we all became intensely internal, interior people. We know this from many best-selling books about how kids no longer play in the woods. They don't even have woods to play in anymore because we cut them all down to turn them into housing or into shopping malls. What happened then, of course, because all these people in suburbia had to eat, is all the farms moved somewhere else. All the farms migrated. I like to think of like little beads of mercury all migrating to the Midwest. 
And instead of four million small farms growing a great diversity of food, now we have mega farms growing basically three things, corn, wheat, and soybeans. Those are the ingredients that make you think when you walk into a supermarket and you see something like 47,000 different products for sale in a, in a supermarket, you think you're being offered this great diversity of food. What you are actually being offered is a great variety of things made out of corn, wheat, and soybeans. That's true for the food that you eat, whether it's corn chips or whether it's the meat you eat because all the meat that you're eating, whether it's uh, beef or pork or chicken, is it's all been fed these grains. What's happened in addition to all of that, of course, we know the health consequences of that. The, you know, the national obesity rate is going up, all kinds of related consequences for that. Um, but we're also looking at a dramatic centralization of power into the hands of very few companies that are selling us these seeds, which now, of course, are almost all GMO, uh, and we are consolidating power in the hands of a very few number of companies. So all these roads that we built have led to a dramatic change in the way we eat. No people in the history of humanity have eaten the way we do. Most of our meals now are eaten quickly and cheaply, and many of them are eaten in a car, it turns out, because we like to drive on all these big, beautiful roads, and we don't have time to sit down for a nice meal, so we gotta go through the drive through and get as much food as quickly as we can and shove it down the hole. That's how Americans eat. We want our food fast, and we want it cheap. That's what we want, and that's what we get. So this system is perfectly designed to deliver us cheap, fast food. This food is not nutritious. It is very high in calories, which is why the American waistline has grown and why its nutritional value has dropped. This is all because of an industrial food system that is aggregated, as I said, because of the construction of the roads, which led to the disappearance of the farms. There are all kinds of consequences, one of which is that we've dramatically reduced the number of varieties of kinds of, fru of foods that we are given access to. Farmers are now planting 97% less diverse crops than they used to. Just thinking about apples, we are now eating 10% of the varieties of apples that we used to eat before the war. It's very convenient, this way of eating. It's very convenient. It's not particularly flavorful, and we know that it has dramatic negative consequences for our health. Some people are becoming much more aware of the damage that it's doing to our ecosystems as well. But when I said we are what we eat, for better or for worse, it also has to do with our identity and our sense of ourselves. This food is very abstract. Ask, a friend of mine is a farmer, she says sometimes she goes into a high school in a city and she asks students where potatoes come from and kids raise their hand and say they think they grow on trees. And why would that be? Well, because most people, if you think about it, maybe secretly admit this to yourself, maybe you've never seen a potato growing. When you think of a potato, you think of it as a salted, fried slice in a vacuum sealed bag. I hate to break it to you, but that's what a real potato looks like. Potatoes don't grow on trees, they grow in the ground. They come out of the dirt, and when kids, especially little kids, discover this, they get all grossed out, and they say, well, I'm never, I don't want, I don't want to eat that. That's an abstract potato. The other thing, of course, that's abstract in a much more uh, dispiriting way are the nine billion animals that Americans consume every year. These animals are invisible. And if you don't believe me, think about when the last time was that you saw the animal that was turned into your hamburger. And the answer, if you're on the East Coast, is never. You've never seen that. You may have seen a cow, and you may have seen a hamburger, but you haven't seen what happens in between. And that's because we have a dramatic network of infrastructure of roads and, and uh, railroads that'll ship cattle out to the Midwest where they get slaughtered, they get processed, they get sent back to you, and you get to eat them pre-frozen at a fast food restaurant or in the supermarket. But the point is, they're invisible. Now, they, didn't, they weren't always invisible. They've been invisible recently for the first time in all of human history. The animals we eat are invisible. Now, you may or may not like that fact. You may or may not be a vegetarian. You may or may not be an enthusiastic meat eater. But the invisibility of it is a problem. It makes all kinds of things possible that you might not normally put up with. For example, the treatment of most of these animals, or the land on which they are raised, or the treatment of the people that are responsible for processing these animals into the food that you eat. On the eastern shore of Maryland, where we, we are here, uh, just to the east of us, uh, there are 570 million chickens on any given day. How often have you seen them? How often have you been inside a chicken house to see 570 million birds? 
Never. The answer is never because the companies won't let you in them. So we have these abstract things happening. Our food comes from somewhere. We have no connection to it. There are all these consequences now we're beginning to understand, like uh, the dramatic decline in the number of monarch butterflies. Now, what does that have to do with our diet? Well, monarchs essentially eat one kind of plant. It's called milkweed. Milkweed is something that grows on the side of farms or grow, it used to grow all around North America. Now, because we spray our crops with so many herbicides to kill the weeds to support the soybeans, we are killing all the food sources of monarch butterflies. It was not the intention to kill monarchs, but the growing of the food the way we do has a negative consequence of killing the food source for monarchs. So now you see, I think monarchs are running at about 4% of their traditional populations. Orangutans, and you may not think, well, what do I eat that is a problem for orangutans? Well, a lot of the fast, like the, the uh, dessert things, like cookies and things, anything made out of palm oil, you'll notice if you look at the ingredients of dessert foods, it's made out of palm oil. Palm oil comes from big plantations in Asia where there used to be rainforests. They cut down the rainforest to grow palm oil to create cookies. No rainforest, no orangutans. So the orangutan is going extinct because we continue to have a huge market for cookies. Now you may think, well, that's too abstract for me. I don't, under, I don't get that. I don't see the link. That's the point. The point is the food is abstract. So all you want is your cookie. If there's an orangutan that you see in a newspaper that's going extinct, you can't see the connection. The connection is direct. It's direct. The decline of the monarch is direct to the way we eat. We spray a chemical called glyphosate, better known as Roundup, on tens of millions of acres around the United States to kill weeds. Now, the World Health Organization recently called it a probable human carcinogen. This is being sprayed all over our land. It's getting into our drinking water. It's getting into our food. It's getting into our bodies. This is just one of many, many uh, industrial scale chemicals we're spraying on our food. The things that we use to kill insects, of course, are having all kinds of negative consequences, like they're causing what's called bee colony collapse. You've heard about this. Bees pollinate a very large percentage of the amount of food that we eat. So no bees, no food. There's something called neonicotinoid pesticides that are made in Germany, but they're banned in Germany. In fact, they're banned in most countries in Europe, but we will happily use them here. Runoff, when we're spraying all of these uh, fields with fertilizers and with insecticides and herbicides, it runs off into our rivers and our streams, ends up in our big watersheds. And here we have a picture of the Chesapeake Bay, which is right where I live in Baltimore. And when all this stuff pours into these bays, it continues to fertilize things. Uh, all kinds of things grow. It creates what are known as dead zones that you can actually see from outer space. This is a hypoxic area in the water that where nothing below it can live. Drive across the United States as I did, and you'll see all these kinds of fields, corn, wheat, soybeans, wherever you go, and nothing else. Think about what you don't see. You don't see forests. You don't see flowers. You don't see wild animals, and you don't even see vegetables. It's food, but it's a kind of a food. Now, we've planted the United States so completely with these crops that we're now pushing into South America, and we're cutting down rainforests in Argentina, Paraguay, Brazil, to repeat this whole process. Now the question, of course, to re-empower ourselves with this dis depressing, dispiriting system that we've grown up with, what are we supposed to do, All right? One thing we can do is to create what's called perennial polyculture agriculture. 70% of our, our diet comes from grain, and grain is the problem. It's not that we're planting too many tomatoes that's causing the problem. It's we have the wrong kind of grain. There's a guy named Wes Jackson at a place called the Land Institute in Kansas who is developing a kind of plant called Kernza. It's a, it's a grain that has root systems that are 10 and 12 feet deep that reduce the need for uh, agricultural chemicals, reduces our need for irrigation, reduces the soil runoff, sequesters carbon coming out of the atmosphere, fantastically uh, uh, promising agricultural technology. Uh, what I like to do with my students is I like to take them out to local farms and have them learn about local food production so they decrease this abstraction between them and their food. Eat local food. Local, local, local is the answer to these problems. I teach English majors that potatoes grow in the dirt and it really turns their beat around. These are not ag students. These are English majors getting their hands dirty. Uh, that's my beloved daughter holding a chicken. She can tell you where chickens come from. 
The earth is sacred and always has been, right? The wisdom, we don't have to reinvent wisdom. Wisdom is out there. We have just lost sight of it. We've lost sight of it. So we have to figure out where to rediscover it. We can rediscover it in things like the science of ecology, where we learn from people like Aldo Leopold that something is ethical if it improves or maintains the biotic community. It's unethical if it doesn't. We can rediscover indigenous wisdom all over the world and learn that people for thousands of years had a much more sustainable relationship with their land and their food. I teach my students about contemplative traditions like Buddhism, where you learn that your mind doesn't have to reach for the chicken nugget just because it's always reached for the chicken nugget. The mind is actually trainable. We can learn about why it is that we do things the way we do things. I teach Taoism, a fabulous uh, philosophical tradition out of China that has a statement that says things like, uh, you can learn from non-human teachers. You can learn from water. The best way to be is to be like water because water nourishes all things and goes against none of them. We can rediscover our beautiful watersheds, get back in touch with our land. The Susquehanna River, which is right down the road, is one of the oldest rivers in the world. It was a river before Pangaea broke apart. I take my students canoeing on the river every semester to get them back in touch with the land. We've forgotten our connections with the land. We need to rediscover them. That will put us back in touch with things. It'll break down the abstraction and things will start fresh. And that is what I was here to say. So thank you very much. <laughs>